Uh, let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 4, the memory verse. Luke chapter 4, verse 4. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The title of the sermon this morning is Every Word of God. Let's start off by reading verse number 1, Luke 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, started to speak in tongues. No, right? No. Hey, when we see people filled with the Holy Ghost in the Bible, what are they doing? They're out preaching the gospel, or in this case, as we see, Jesus being taken up into the wilderness to pray and fast. Look, they're not wasting their time speaking some gibberish language, all right? Some, some nonsense language. Hey, tongue speaking is biblical. Hey, I can speak two tongues, English and Spanish. And maybe some of you have the ability to speak other languages. That's great. Hey, but what you see in a lot of these Pentecostal charismatic churches is nonsense. Okay, they claim to be fueled by the Holy Ghost, but no. What we see in the Bible, when you're full of the Holy Ghost, you're either preaching the gospel or you're praying and fasting, as we see here in Jesus Christ. Hey, and when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, what do we see here? Uh, Full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Guys, if we want to be believers that are being led by the Spirit, what do we need to be? Have in our life. We need to be filled by the Holy Ghost. We need to be full of the Holy Ghost in order for our steps to be led by the Holy Spirit. And notice the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. Verse number two. Being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Of course he'd be hungry, right? Of course Jesus Christ would be hungry after fasting for 40 days. Look at verse number three. He comes the devil... You know, concerned about the welfare of Jesus Christ, right? Concerned that he's hungry. So what does, Je- what does the devil say about Jesus? And by the way, I'm being sarcastic there. He says in verse number 3, And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone to be made, uh, that, it be, that it be made bread. Command this stone that it may be made bread. Now, when I first read this in the Bible as a child, I remember reading this, and I'm thinking, wow, Satan's really concerned for Jesus, right? <laughs> Satan really wants Jesus just to eat. Because look, is there anything wrong in of itself to eat bread? Of course not. And then this got me thinking about what what Satan is like. What is the devil like? Look, the devil, when he comes and approaches you the first time, it's not to tempt you to do necessarily sins. Hey, when Satan comes, he's going to come, you know, concerned for your welfare. You know, finding something, some lack in your life and saying, hey, I can feel that for you. Hey, I can give you direction, and it's going to seem like the devil just wants to help you. Okay? But as we see in this passage, that is far from the truth. Okay? Now, again, there's nothing sinful to eat bread of itself. But look at verse number 3 again. What are the first words out of Jesus' mouth? If thou be the Son of God. Now, is Jesus Christ the Son of God? Absolutely, right? Absolutely. If you've read the Bible, you, you, you know, you'll come to the conclusion that Jesus Christ is definitely the Son of God or God the Son. Some people put it that way, right? And so the first thing you see out of the devil's mouth is to create some doubt. Are you really the Son of God? If thou be the Son of God, right? He comes and doubts the Word of God. Now keep your finger there. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 we see the very first introduction of Satan in the Bible. And what is he doing? Two things. We'll see this in Genesis 3, chapter 1. Genesis 3, chapter 1, the Bible says, Now the serpent, that being a reference to Satan, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So what's the first thing that he says to Eve? He wants her to doubt the word of God. All right. The reason why I stand firm on the King James Bible and say that it's perfect and preserved because I don't want to doubt the Word of God. All right. If I was reading or, or teaching from the NIV, the New American Standard Version, the New King James Version, or any of these other uh, corruptions, I'm going to constantly be doubting the Word of God because there's constant contradictions. Okay. And I remember being in a church, growing up in the Baptist Union Church. All right. Thank God, the first pastor that I was there was King James. But then they, they went through different pastors, always different Bibles. And you know, I can't remember what Bible I had at that time, but we'd read stuff and I couldn't even follow what was in the Word of God because it was saying something totally different. I don't know what the Word of God is saying. I don't know which one's right. Okay, But that's what the devil wants. The reason why there are so many English translations, guys, it's not the translation itself that's a problem. 
but so many differences is because yes, ultimately copyright issues, yes, ultimately to make a buck, yes, ultimately the love of money, but the root of all that, guys, is Satan wanting us to doubt the word of God. All right, look at verse number two. And the woman said unto, unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now here's the concern of the devil, right? Verse number four. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Hey Eve, I'm here just for your welfare. I just want you to have an increase in knowledge. I just want you to know that if you eat this fruit, you'll be like gods. You'll know uh, the difference between good and evil. All right, you'll know these things. You see how Satan comes, right? Doubting the word of God and coming to pretend to be your friend, pretending to look after your needs. Go back to Luke chapter uh, four. Actually, go to uh, what do I want? Where do I want you to turn to? Yeah, keep your finger there. Go to John chapter eight. John chapter eight, verse twenty-eight. Because I want you to think about what is it? What was the problem for Jesus to turn the, the stone into bread? Okay, what was the underlying issue there? John chapter 8, verse 28. John chapter 8, verse 28. And this is when Jesus Christ, of course, is defending himself and, and, and attacking the Pharisees. A uh, very, very popular uh, chapter here. But Jesus says in John 8, 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. Look at, the, look at the next words. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Verse 29, And he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Now notice what Jesus Christ would do when he was on this earth. He sought the will of the Father. He sought to please the Father, and he only taught and did the things the Father asked him to do. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with bread in of itself. But there's something wrong when you're listening to Satan and, and eating of that bread, right? If God wants you to have bread, then he's going to provide that. And of course, as working fathers, that's, that's our job to go out, work a job, make, make money so we can provide for our family. Hey, but Jesus Christ was filled by the Holy Ghost and led into the wilderness, meaning that God would ultimately look after his son. Okay? He does not need the devil to step in and take that role. All right. So what was the problem? That if he turned the stone into bread, he was listening to Satan. He'd be following the direction of Satan rather than listening to his father and doing the will of the father. That's the first problem. Okay. Satan wants you to turn you away from God's word, doubt his word, and give an ear to what Satan has to say to you. Okay. That is problem number one. Go back to Luke chapter four. Luke chapter four. Verse four. And Jesus answered him, saying, Now, this is very important to understand why this was a major problem to turn the stone into bread following after Satan. Verse number four, And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word of God. Please absorb this into your minds, guys. I, I know you love the Lord. I know you love the Bible. But I know how hard it is to get through the Bible cover to cover. Okay, I know how challenging it is, okay? But more important than our daily bread, our physical bread that nourishes our physical body, is the Word of God. More important than that is this book, the Bible, the Word of God. This is, Jesus Christ compares the Word like bread, all right? Jesus Christ says this is what we need to nourish the new man, to nourish the Spirit of God. If you want to be full of the Holy Ghost, as Jesus was, then you need to consume the Word of God, okay, daily. Hey, how often do you eat a meal, all right? I mean, most people have a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Most people, right? Just to keep themselves uh, going, maybe two meals a day, you know, at least one meal a day. Most people at least have one meal, even if they're doing some type of fast, they're having at least one meal, usually, right? Uh, so look, the same principle applies for the new man, okay? If, if, uh, if Jesus uses this comparison, it means we need to take the Word of God and feast on his word at least once a day, twice a day, even three times a day, and as much as you need to, right? As much as you can absorb the word of God, nourish that new man, be full of the Holy Ghost, you're going to be able to hear from God, and he's going to be able to direct your path. But we need every word of God, okay? This is, again, why the King James Bible, I believe it's perfect. Every word is needed, 
We can't just start taking verses out of the Bible. We can't just start taking words out of the Bible. We can't just start, start taking the blood of Christ out of the Bible. All right, and think we're going to be nourished as believers. No, we need the entire Word of God available to us. Thank God He's given us the King James Bible uh, for our, our nourishment today. All right, now, uh, now, why is this important? What is Jesus actually referring to? You don't need to turn there. I'll just read it to you quickly. But Jesus Christ is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. De- Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He's quoting that. In, in other words, he's memorized the Bible. Okay, he's memorized certain passages of the book of Deuteronomy, okay, and this is how he's overcoming the temptations of Satan. Now, let me read to you what he quoted. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. It says, And he humbled thee, speaking to Israel, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. All right. So what was the, what is Jesus comparing his situation to? When Israel were in the wilderness themselves and were without food. Okay. But how did God provide for them? Hey, he brought down heavenly bread, the manna, which ultimately is a type, a picture of the body of Christ. We're going to that right now. But who provided for the Israelites during that time? It was God himself. God performed the miracle and provided that manna to fall and feed the Israelites. And Jesus uses that to quote to Satan. So in other words, Satan says, hey, turn this stone into bread. And Jesus says, look, we know that the Father can rain down manna, essentially is what he's saying. Okay? And so he's looking for provision from God the Father rather than listening to the devil. Hey, sometimes... You know, there's this saying, hey, the ends does not justify the means. Hey, the ends might be something positive. It might be something good that you're trying to achieve. But you need to do it biblically. You need to do it the way God wants you to do it and not go about making it your own way or doing it some sort of way that the devil wants you to achieve. All right? Same thing with Jesus. He knew the bread was coming. He was just waiting for the Lord to provide. Okay? Verse number 5, Luke 4, 5. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. So what does the devil ultimately want, guys? Is he looking for your welfare? Huh? Is he, does he want you to have a bit of bread? No, ultimately, the devil wants to be worshipped. Instead of you worshipping the Lord God, He wants your worship. Now, some people debate as to how much control the devil has over the, you know, uh, the, you know, the, um, the powers of the earth. And if you look at verse six, it says, you know, all this power I will give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. So one, one view is basically the reason Satan is able to tempt Jesus with this and say these things is because he does have full control over the governments and powers of this world. That's one way to look at it. But we also know the devil is the father of lies, all right? So um, I'm not sure exactly how much power he has, you know? I'm not sure exactly uh, what he's able to offer, you know? Obviously, the Lord p- puts certain limits on Satan, okay? And obviously, we know that government in of itself is a God, in- uh, is an institution that God ordained, okay? Now, so take that as you will, you know? I'm, I-, I don't know how much Satan is actually really offering there. But ultimately, he wants Jesus Christ to worship him and uh, let's look at, I'm going to read to you very quickly uh, from Revelation 11, verse 15. Again, if you want to turn this up to you, Revelation 11, verse 15. It says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hey, Satan was offering Jesus something that the Father has already offered Jesus Christ. But it's something that's going to come in the future. All right, After God rains down His wrath upon this world, when Jesus Christ comes back and establishes His kingdom, He's going to receive all the kingdoms of the world. All right, But what's important about this? What's, in, what's the key thing about the Father offering it to the Son? It said, and He shall reign forever and ever. Hey, isn't it God, Jesus Christ will be reigning 
forever. Okay? His kingdom will be forever. What Satan was offering, even if it was all the powers of the kingdom of the world, it was only a temporal thing. It's only an earthly, uh, uh, worldly thing that, that will come to an end at some point. All right? Now, you can either listen to Satan and follow after his ways, but let me just tell you now, that's temporal. It's going to end, and it's going to end in your destruction. All right? Or you can listen to God. He promises you the mansions, the, the streets of gold, the, the heavenly Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth. You know, all the rewards in heaven that you're able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, claim for yourself, all those things, being blessed, being the son of God, and it's eternal. <laughs> Which of these two things are you going to take in life? Okay? Do you want to satisfy the now? Or do you want, are, you, are your eyes fixed upon eternity, fixed upon the future? And look, obviously Satan has some power. Obviously he has, look, I, I think a lot of these celebrities, you know, we read about a lot of these musicians, right? And how many times do they say, I mean, so many of them, from, from rock stars to pop stars, you know, say they sold their soul to the devil or something along those lines, and that's how they achieved their success. That's how they became musically talented, is by giving themselves, aligning themselves, worshipping Satan. So obviously there's something to this. Okay, there's obviously something to it. And again, it's probably very tempting for those that only have a temporal view of life. But again, life goes on, it's eternal, you know. Life goes on, it's eternal. So what God offers is obviously much more superior than what Satan is able to uh, offer there. Look at verse number 8. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only, sorry, and him only shalt thou serve. Okay, so uh, now if you're reading the book of which we are, we're going through the book of Luke, you'll notice that there is a third temptation after this that's written here. And you might be wondering as you read this in verse 8, if Jesus says, get there behind me, Satan, why is Satan still, um, you know, uh, giving him a third temptation here in the book of Luke? Well, the truth is, and I'll show this later on, the truth is, Satan did flee from Jesus Christ at this point in time. Now remember, when we went through Luke chapter 1, I explained to you guys that the book of Luke is not written in a strict chronological order. Okay, we'll have a look at this in a minute. Uh, but just keep that in mind. So when Satan says, get thee behind me, Satan surely did. All right, he, he, he fled from Jesus Christ. Now the Bible says in James 4, 7, just very quickly, it says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Hey, we have the power through the Holy Ghost to resist the devil. All right, we stand by his word. Hey, if it helps us to overcome temptations, then quote scriptures, okay, and he will flee from us. Let's look at verse number nine. Verse number nine. And he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, if, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had, had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. So we see there that the devil, once Jesus Christ overcame these temptations, that the devil departed from him. Next words are important. For a season. All right? For a while. Now understand this. We are not the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Yes, we, you know, we have his righteousness imputed upon us. Yes, we're a child of, of the Father. But ultimately, we still have this sinful nature. Okay? Now you, in your Christian life, uh, you are going to have spiritual victories. Okay? There are going to be times that you defeat the devil. All right, through his word. And there are times that he's going to, you're going to resist him, he's going to flee from you. But remember this, it's only for a season. Okay, the devil's coming back. He's going to come back and do it again. He's going to try, he's going to find a time, and maybe not the devil, Satan himself, but one of his devils that he's got, okay, find a weakness in you and try to take you down. Don't think just because I had a spiritual victory yesterday, the devil's not going to attack you today. Okay, you, we always need to be aware the devil's like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, the Bible says. All right, so let's keep a, th a few things in mind here. So he's basically saying to Jesus, take him to the top of the temple and says, look, 
basically commit suicide, right? Throw yourself down from this, uh, from this, uh, tower and, and God promises that he's going to not, not allow your foot to dash against a stone, that the angels will, will charge over thee and keep thee. Now, I'm going to read to you again from, by the way, this is from the Bible. Satan quoted the Bible. What I'm trying, what I'm trying to get to guys is that don't assume anybody, any preacher, anyone is just of God. All right. Even Satan himself can take the Bible and quote it. All right. We got to be careful about this. Now, what did he quote? He quoted Psalm 91 verse 11. Don't turn there. I want you to stay in Luke 4, Psalm 91 11. Okay. So I'm going to read to you what the Old Testament says. And you guys read what he said, uh, what Satan said, right? So you guys are uh, just reading from um, uh, verse 10, Luke 4, verse 10. I'll read to you from Psalm 91, 11. Let's see how similar it is. And I'll read it slowly because I want you to see what's missing. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. I'll just stop there. Do you see anything missing there? In your, what he quoted, what Satan quoted, he didn't quote all of the psalm. He didn't quote, to keep thee in all thy ways. All right, so keep this in mind. Say, uh, Jesus has been uh, fasting for 40 days, right? He's in the wilderness. He's without food. He's hungry, all right? And the angels have not yet come to serve Christ. They've not yet come to minister and help him. And Satan wants to speed up this process. He says, look, just cast yourself down now, right? And the, and the angels will come and they'll come and, and rescue you. They'll come and minister. They'll come and serve you. They'll help you out of this difficult situation. All right? Let's read on. Go back to Luke chapter 4. Well, you guys are probably there. Luke 4. Actually, no, I'm getting a little confused. So just bear with me. Uh, let me just remember what I'm up with. Okay. So what was missing? To keep thee in all thy ways. All thy ways. Satan is saying, if you cast yourself down, then the angels are going to come. But Psalm 91 said, if it, the Lord's going to look after you in all thy ways. Okay. You don't have to throw yourself down from a temple, commit suicide, put yourself in a position where you're forcing God to come to your rescue. No, God is always with us. He's always going to provide our needs. Okay? That's what Satan uh, left out when he quoted the Bible. All right? He, he left that out. Now, I want you to go to Matthew chapter 4. Let's go to our parallel passage, passage here. Matthew chapter 4. For two reasons. And I want to, I'm going to wrap, I'm going to get this all together for you in, in a minute. If, if it sounds a bit disjointed, just let me get to it. Matthew 4 verse 3. Matthew 4 verse 3. So we have another, another record here of the temptation of Christ, but this time it's in chronological order. Okay, it's in chronological order. Matthew 4 verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So, yep, that's the first one. Look at the, look at the next temptation. Then the temple, the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Verse, uh, verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Verse 8, Again, the devil taketh him up unto an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now notice this, verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him and behold, now notice this, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. All right. So we see the order of the temptations were different in Matthew 4. They're in chronological order. The reason we know this is because when you read Matthew 4, it says, once, once you get through the first temptation, it says, then the devil taketh him. Then, so then he's following it. And then verse 8 on the third one, it says, again, 
the devil taketh him up. So again, he's doing another temptation. So in Matthew, it's in chronological order. If you notice in Luke, every time the temptations come up, it says, and the devil, or whatever, and, and, and. Instead of then being following, it's and, and, and. Let's put it this way. If we were talking about church this morning, and, and so, let's say someone asks you, you know, what did you guys do in church this morning? You know, what was church like? You might answer this way. You know, not in a strict chronological order. You say, well, you know, we heard a sermon from Luke 4, and we sang hymns, you know, and we heard a testimony from Brother Sam, and we, you know, and we did whatever. We fellowshiped and whatever, okay? So you, you can include all those things, okay? And, and it's all true, okay? But when you're using and, 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 all you're saying is all the things that took place during that time. But if you're using words like then, you know, well, we, we sang a hymn, then we prayed, then we sang another hymn, then we did the memory verses, then now you're talking about a chronological order. Does that make sense? All right. And again, the reason why Luke, the book of Luke was written in a way to be more thematic, to be uh, more uh, topical in its nature of its, the way it's uh, written. And I'll explain to you a little bit more in that in a minute. Okay. But notice that once Satan had fled away, that God had sent the angels, we saw that in Matthew, to minister unto Jesus. All right. What Satan was saying to Jesus was, you've got to throw yourself from the temple, essentially, for the Satan to come and help you. You know, and no, Jesus knew, hey, no, if I'm being led here by the Holy Ghost, if I'm being led by the Spirit, yes, it's challenging in the wilderness. Yes, there's a lack of food, but I know my Heavenly Father is going to come and provide my needs. All right, and He does, okay? He does send His angels to come and minister unto Christ. I'm sure He came, they came and gave Him food and His nourishment to, uh, to get through it all. So keep that in mind, guys. If, if, the, if the Holy Ghost has given you guidance, has given you a way to walk, and you don't have all the answers, but you know it's from God, it's established in the Word of God, then take that step of faith, okay? Because the Lord God is going to provide all your needs. You don't need to listen to Satan and find some other way. No, if the Lord's leading you, He's going to provide all your needs. Okay, um, now verse number 9, Luke chapter 4, verse 9. Luke chapter 4, verse 9. Sorry, we read that already. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus returned. So once he's gone through that time of temptation, returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. So we see once he gets back, there's fame of Jesus Christ. People are talking about him. He's going in the synagogues, you know, and teaching the word of God. You know, he's proclaiming boldly, speaking out of authority. He's opening their eyes to the, to the news of God, to the word of God. And the fame is being spread out about this Jesus Christ. But look at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up for to read. So I just first thing I just want you to notice then, I, I love the, the fact that it says, as his custom was. I love that, okay? Because the synagogues in this day, now I'll just keep this in mind, God never told the Israelites to build synagogues, okay? Now it's not wrong that they've done that. What you need to understand about the synagogues, synagogues today, when we talk about synagogues, we think about Judaism. We think about the religion of Judaism, okay? But the synagogues in Jesus' time, we're just community centers, all right? Just like we, like, you know, if we've met in a community center, we, we did, right? In Kawana Waters, that was a community center. We met there. That's like a synagogue. It's a place where the public are free to come and, and use for their purposes. You know, maybe for, you know, parties or, or celebrations or, you know, anything. You know, but on the Sabbath day, it was used to come and hear the word of God. Because remember, in those days, they did not have the 66 books of the Bible in one volume like we have, that they can hold in their hand, all right? In those days, they would have to copy the Word of God by hand, okay? That's why it's called manuscripts. Uh, scripts is writing, and man is like manual. They had to manually write their out with their hands, all right? So, and so it was, it was difficult for every family to have the Bible in their homes, so they would go into the synagogues and hear it read. 
So in many ways, the synagogues in Jesus' time, though it was on the Sabbath or Saturday, was like church. You'd come and hear the word of God being read and being preached. And what we see of Jesus Christ, it says, as his custom was. All right. And we should say as families, what's our custom for a Sunday? It's to be in church, I hope, right? I hope that we would walk in the steps of Jesus Christ and say whenever the church is open, whenever there's church service, it's our custom as a family to be there. All right? That's how it should be. And notice what else happened. He went into the synagogue, verse 16, on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Guys, church is a place where the Word of God is to be read. All right, you go to these modern churches. Again, I'm going to attack the Pentecostals and the Charismatics. What are they focused on? Is it the reading of the Word of God? No. In fact, some of their sermons barely contain the Word of God. And whatever Word of God is in there, it's corrupt anyway. All right? Look, their focus is on the music. Their focus is on their experiences, on their stories. No, it's a place to come and read the Word of God. That's why we make it our custom you know, every service to read through at least one chapter of the Bible. Verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. Esaias. And when he had opened the book, this is Isaiah, by the way. This is the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. I love this. And um, look, keep your... Turn to Isaiah 61. Let's have a look at what Jesus Christ is reading. Turn to Isaiah 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61, verse 1. I, I love this passage for several reasons. But again, we see the, the Trinity here, okay, being pictured here. Isaiah 60, uh, sorry, yeah, Isaiah 61, verse 1. Now, you guys read there. I'm going to read to you from Luke 4. You guys read Isaiah 61 from verse 1. I'm going to read to you from Luke uh, chapter 4. These are the words that Jesus read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set them at liberty, them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then, you got, and then in, in Luke 4, it says, in verse 20, And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Did you guys notice there was something extra? You, you got, what were you reading? Isaiah 61, right? Did you notice that when, when I was reading through Luke 4, there was something extra that Jesus mentioned? Um, in Isaiah 61, sorry, in... Uh, Ah, I'm losing my, my spot here. Oh, yeah. Isaiah, sorry, in, in Luke 4, Jesus said, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. That is not in that passage. Okay, that is not in Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. To set at liberty them that are bruised. Okay, now there's a couple of thoughts here. Why did Jesus add these words? Well, first of all, let me just say, Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Okay, Jesus is God. He has all authority if he wants to add something to the scriptures, he's entitled to do that, right? It's his book, first of all, okay? Uh, secondly, this wouldn't be the first time that Jesus, well, this wouldn't be the only time Jesus adds something to the Bible. Now, if you guys remember the great commandment to love the Lord our God with all our strength, with all our, our, our heart, and with all our, our soul, Jesus adds something in the New Testament, with all thy mind, Okay, in the Old Testament, it does not say to love God with all your mind, but Jesus Christ adds that to the great commandment in the New Testament. So it wouldn't be the first time that Jesus does this. All right. Another view is that uh, Jesus is given a commentary. He's added a few more words because he's, he's expounding the scriptures. He's not just reading it, but he's expounding what he read. Okay, that's one, that's another view. The third view is that he's comparing scripture with scripture. So um, in Luke 4. If you guys can go back to Luke 4, verse 19, Luke 4, verse, sorry, 18, Luke 4, verse 18, just the last words, last words there, to set at liberty them that are bruised may come from Isaiah 58, verse 6. I'll just read it to you. Isaiah 58, verse 6, it says, Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens? And then he says this, 
and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke. So there's the same idea of, of, of liberty to the captives, right? In Isaiah 58 verse 6, though it's not word for word the same, okay? So my personal take on this is that Jesus, as he was reading, was expounding the words of God. He may have been comparing Scripture with Scripture. All, all that just to say this. These are good principles when reading the Word of God, when preaching the Word of God, right? It's a good thing to, uh, to compare Scripture with Scripture, all right? That may have been what Jesus did, but also it's a good thing to expound what you're reading, okay? To expound the Word of God. These are just things that we see Jesus Christ doing in the you know, early, early church, if you will, in the synagogues, uh, and something that we can be doing today as preachers as well. Okay, now go back to Luke 4, Luke 4, verse 20, Luke 4, verse 20. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in a synagogue were fastened on him. So after Jesus pre reads this and preaches, he sits down and they're all looking at him, right? Now, the, the Bible doesn't really tell us, or it does actually a little bit, tell us why that is. Uh, if we look at uh, verse 21. And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears, and all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. So one of those reasons is because of the gracious words that came out of the mouth of Jesus. Okay? Another reason why their eyes may have been fixed on him is because of the fame that was going out about him. Okay? Everybody was hearing about how great he was. Another reason might be is that he didn't finish reading all of Isaiah 61. He didn't finish that verse. And I'll just quickly show you what verse he missed out on. And um, sorry, I'm getting you guys to jump all over the place, but uh, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 2, it says, in verse 2, Isaiah 61, verse 2 says, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, then there's a comma. Okay, the, the sentence has not finished. But this is where Jesus Christ closed the book. He didn't read the rest of it. Because the rest of the book says this. The rest of the verse says this. And the day of vengeance of our God to, to comfort all that mourn. Hey, the, the day of the vengeance of God is what we commonly read as the day of the Lord. All right? It's when the Lord will pour out His wrath upon this earth. And Jesus Christ closed the book before He got to that. Okay? And then in Luke 4, he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So obviously he did not want to talk about the wrath of God being poured out on the earth because it hadn't not yet happened. It's still a future event. But we see another good principle of Jesus Christ. He's able to rightly divide the word of God. Okay? He's able to rightly divide the word of truth. And so Jesus Christ could, could teach, hey, you know, the acceptable year of the Lord has come. Jesus Christ is here. But the day of his vengeance it has not yet come. That is still a future thing to come. All right, now look at verse 22. Luke 4, verse 22. And all bear him witness, and wonder at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And notice, just, just that, that beautiful thing, right? Gracious words that came out of the mouth of Jesus, right? People loved listening to him. He was, he was a preacher that people could listen to and learn and grow from. Look, Jesus Christ was trying to send a message when he was preaching, when he read the Word of God, he wanted the people's ears to hear him, okay? He wasn't being obnoxious for no reason, all right? He wasn't being difficult for no reason. His words were gracious, okay, for people to listen to it and think about it and contemplate what was being said. But look at verse 22. There's a problem here. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Now, we just finished, well, we just finished reading about Jesus Christ being the Son of God, all right? Jesus Christ is God the Son. God manifest in the flesh, all right? And they're saying, is this not Joseph's son? Now look, you might think that's just an innocent question because obviously he grew up in the household of Joseph and Mary, okay? But it's, it's not just a cu curious question. They're actually rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ at this point, okay? Jesus Christ affirms this in verse 23. Look at verse 23. And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, also, uh, do also here in this country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. 
So what is he saying? If they're not just asking an innocent question. They're actually not accepting him. They're rejecting him. They're rejecting the words that he said. Even though they're, they're sort of amazed at his teaching, at his fame, at the gracious words that he said, they still rejected him. Okay? Because they're like, this is Jesus. This is just Joseph's son. We know him. We've grown up with him. Okay? Now, what I find very interesting is in verse 23, Jesus says, and he said unto them, you will surely say unto me this Proverbs. So he's saying to the people in Nazareth, he says, you're going to surely say this to me. Think about the words. Think about when, when do you think they said this to him? Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. What does that sound like? I'll let anyone answer. If, if you can think about it. Matthias? When he died on the cross. Exactly. Keep your finger there. Go to Mark 15. Go to Mark 15. Mark 15 verse 29. Mark 15 verse 29. Mark 15, verse 29, the Bible says, And they that passed by railed on him. This is when Jesus Christ is on the, on the cross, wagging their heads. And this is Jerusalem, by the way. This is a long ways from uh, Nazareth. Saying, uh, our, our, sorry, our, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Hey, that's a lot like the parable that Jesus says that they're going to say about him. Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also in thy country. We've heard that you're healing others. Why don't you heal yourself, physician? All right, so that's, that's the mocking that we see play out at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, which tells me that his own people from Nazareth was there in Jerusalem, mocking him as he died on the cross. They, they, a lot of these people just outright rejected Jesus Christ. All right. Now, I'll just say one thing if, in Luke 4, 24. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is, is accepted in his own country. You know, one of the reasons why I'm on the Sunshine Coast and not in Sydney <laughs> is because this verse, as I was thinking about becoming a pastor, this verse just rang into my mind. Right? No prophet is accepted in his own country. I was born and raised in Sydney. And as I read this, I thought, man, I need to get out of Sydney then, right? I need to find somewhere else to go. Now, I'm not saying that's a principle for everybody, but I'm just saying that's part of, the re- part of the reason why I'm up here on the Sunshine Coast. But for whatever reason, the Lord led me to start a satellite church in Sydney as well. Uh, so that's interesting in, in of itself. Verse 25, Luke, 5, Luke 4, 25. But I tell you a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias. Uh, that's uh, 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 Elijah, by the way. When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Serepta, a city of Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow. So we won't go into it now, guys, but you may know of the Old Testament story of a famine in the land of Israel, which I think was three years and six months, three and a half years from memory. I might be a little bit wrong on that. I'm pretty sure that's right. But hey, it was a time of famine. I mean, just going through one season of famine is tough enough. Imagine three and a half years of famine, all right? People were dying of hunger, and he he finds this widow and her son. And if you remember, Elijah does a great miracle, and he multiplies the food, and he multiplies the oil for the woman, okay? But here's the lesson. She received Elijah, and through the power of God, he was able to provide for her needs, okay? And for those that are ready to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, He's going to come there and bless them, forgive them, save them, and provide their needs. All right? We have two groups of people here. And by the way, she's a Gentile. She's not an Israelite woman. Okay? Elijah, in the same way, was rejected by his own people. Hey, they had a prophet of God in their midst. You'd think if you're going through famine, you'd go to the man of God and ask for some help. Okay? And they didn't do that. Instead, we have a widow woman, a Gentile woman, that was blessed by the preaching and work of Elijah. All right? Same thing with Jesus. Jesus is comparing himself to Elijah here. And then verse 27, Luke 4, 27. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of uh, Eliseus the prophet, that's Elisha. And none of them were, were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Another Gentile, a Syrian, Naaman. You, know, you may know the story where Elisha told Naaman to go and, and bathe himself in the uh, Jordan River seven times, and that he'd be cleansed from his leprosy. We won't go into that story right now. But again, there were many lepers in that time in Israel. 
Many of them could have come to Elisha for help, but they rejected the man of God. Instead, we have the Gentiles being blessed. Okay, What's the lesson? If Jesus Christ is comparing himself to these two prophets, what's the lesson? That his own people would reject him. Okay, And yeah, many Israelites were saved, don't get me wrong. Many, many Jews were saved in the ministry of Christ. But by and large, the nation as a whole rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and crucified him to the cross. Hey, but the Gentiles, most of us are Gentiles, right? I mean, I think we're all Gentiles. Okay, we have the blessing, okay, of receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. But look, it's no different, regardless of your race, regardless of your background, ethnicity. There are people out there ready to receive the Word of God, ready to receive you as a prophet, if you will, okay, with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there are those that are not going to receive you, they're going to reject you. So what? You move on, you go on to those that are ready to receive the Word of God. Don't be discouraged when people don't receive you. Don't be discouraged when they say they're not interested. Just move on. We see the same thing happen to Jesus Christ. Why do you think it's going to be better for you? All right, it's the same thing that happened to Jesus Christ. The people rejected him. Verse 28, verse 28, Luke 4, 28. And all they in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the bro of the hill wherein their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. This is the first attempt we read about. They're trying to kill Jesus Christ before his time. And verse 30, But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. I believe that's a miracle. I believe somehow, I don't know how, maybe he made himself in, invisible or intangible or, or, they, or, the, or blinded their eyes somehow. But Jesus Christ was able to pass through their midst uh, safely. All right? It wasn't his time to die. Verse 31, And came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for the word was with power. Now notice the next thing. So Jesus Christ has just gone, he's moved on unto other synagogues, teaching the word of God. And let's just use the synagogue here as a, as a, about church. You know, like I said, it's, it's sort of like a church back then, all right? But what do we find in the synagogue? What do we find in the church? And in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice. Hey, look, where was this possessed man? (laughs) He was at church. (laughs) He was with God's people hearing the preaching of God's word. Look, don't assume. Look, thank God for this church. I thank God for New Life Baptist Church. You know, I I don't think any of you are are devil, right? (laughs) But one day, one day, we may very well have somebody that comes in here with an unclean spirit. Hey, one day you may move on in life and be part of some other church. You need to be aware that maybe everybody around you is not a brother in Christ. They could very well be possessed by an unclean spirit. All right? Verse 34. Saying, let us alone. This is what the devil said. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Hey, the devil's speaking truth. The devil says, you're the Holy One of God, right? Verse 35, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. Notice something about the unclean spirit. What does the unclean spirit do to the man he was possessing? He threw him in the midst. What do we see in the Pentecostal churches? Don't we see people just falling on the floors, having seizures, doing crazy things, and they're saying they're filled by the Holy Ghost? Hey, you don't see the Holy Ghost throwing people around. All right? In the Bible, it's the unclean spirits, it's the devils that are trying to hurt people, trying to throw them to the ground. All right? We've got to be careful because we may have people with unclean spirits come in here trying to do the same tricks, okay? trying to do the same thing. And let me just say, the Pentecostal Charismatic Movement is full of devils, full of unclean spirits. Verse 36. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place in the country round about, and he arose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. Now, just a couple of thoughts here. Just very quickly, and I've got a lot to cover here, but let me just get through it. Simon had, Simon Peter had a mother-in-law. 
All right, he had a mother-in-law. Praise God. Which means he was married. All right, he had a wife. All right, he had a mother-in-law living there in his house, and she was sick. Right now, the Roman Catholic Church. What do they teach? What are their leaders taught not to do? They're commanded. They're taught not to marry. They're commanded to remain celibate. Okay. Now, I, for, I don't believe the celibate at all. Okay. I believe the reason why there's so much perversion, so much homosexuality, so much pedophilia in that church is because they're not being celibate. Okay. And they're disobeying the word of God and they're burning with lust and they end up becoming full reprobates in that kind of church. Okay. But notice, the reason I bring that up is because they say Peter was their first pope. Okay. They say, they say Peter was their first pope. But we see in the Bible, Jesus, uh, Simon Peter was married. Now, let me just read to you uh, from 1 Timothy 4.1. It says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What are some of these doctrines of devils? Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Verse 3, Forbidding to marry. Hey, this is a doctrine of the devil. Forbidding people to marry. That is what the Roman Catholic Church does. That's why they're filled with reprobates. That's why they're children of the devil. Because they've taken on the doctrines of the devils. And commanded them to abstain from meats, which God have created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So, vegans and vegetarians, it's fine if you want that, that as your diet. But if, that's, if you're forcing people to do that, that's a doctrine of the devil. Okay, that's doctrines of devils. Now, just another passage, quickly, 1 Corinthians 9, 5. We already covered this when we went through Corinthians, but just very quickly. Paul is saying here, Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? So, remember, Paul himself was unmarried. He says, look, I've got the power to take on a wife, as the other apostles, and then, and as the brethren of the Lord, and Cephas. What's Cephas? Who's Cephas? Peter. So, we have Paul confirming that Peter is married, Okay. So we see this in two passages, that Peter definitely was married, uh, but Paul and Barnabas were uh, single and were unmarried during this, uh, at this time. Anyway, Luke 4, verse 39. Luke 4, verse 39. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. <laughs> so she's sick with a, with a great fever. Jesus heals her immediately. She goes and serves him and serves them. She immediately goes and ministers. Look, if someone's recovered from a sickness, aren't you normally like, hey, look, take it gentle, you know, just, just, just rest, you know, recover. Look, when Jesus Christ heals, it's immediate. It's done. All right? Again, look at these Pentecostal churches, right? That they try to find somebody that can, maybe can't walk. I've seen videos of this. They can't walk. Say, all right, you don't need that. You know, you, you don't need those crutches anymore. You know, the Lord rebuked the, the, the sickness or whatever. And then they try to lift them up on their feet. And what are they doing? They're walking gingerly. Right? They're struggling. And they're like, praise God, look at this great miracle. No, look, if she can't get up and, and start cooking and serving, then it's not of God. When God heals, it's a complete healing. Okay? It's completely taken care of. And I believe this is a, a, a symbol, a symbolism of salvation. Hey, we're all sick with sin. We've all got that sinful nature in us. Okay? We're all dying with a fever, if you will. Okay? But when Jesus Christ steps in and we receive him as our savior in faith, when he comes and he heals us, he forgives us of our sin, it's immediately, okay? And, and what? You can serve him. You can minister. You can, you can serve the Lord as soon as you're saved. Praise God. You can tell other people, tell other families about what Jesus Christ has done for you and give them the same gospel. All right? Verse 40, Luke 4, 40. Now when the sun was setting and they had and they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Every one of them, by the way. Every one of them. <laughs> and the devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. Look, you'd think these are good words <laughs> for, the, for the devils to be saying, right? But look, and he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Again, think about some churches. Look, there are many, many churches here on the Sunshine Coast. Many churches, many preachers will point to Jesus. 
Many of them will say he's the Holy One of God, like we saw before. Many of them will say, hey, this is the Son of God. Hey, many false prophets, many ministers of Satan will speak the truth. Hey, they, ha- they don't have a problem pointing you to Jesus. But what they'll do is say, if you want to receive salvation, that's what, they, that's what they're working on, right? They're going to tell you some false gospel. They're going to say it's by works, or they're going to say it's by repenting of your sins, or they're going to say it's by baptism, or they're going to say you've got to receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, or they're going to say all these, these things. Okay, they don't mind pointing you to Jesus. Okay, don't think just because they mention Jesus that they're saved. Don't think just because they point to Jesus that you're, they're your brother. They may very well be possessed by an unclean spirit. We see even the unclean spirits don't mind pointing you to Jesus. Okay, but what they want to do is cloud the gospel. They don't want you saved, these false prophets. That's why they cloud the gospel. They don't mind you, talk, you knowing about Jesus. I mean, we go out there, preach the gospel. People already know about Jesus, don't they? But what don't they know? How to receive eternal life, okay, which is through faith. All right? Verse 42. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people saw him and came unto him and stayed him, that he should not depart from them. And he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. So we'll just leave it there. We just see the heart of Jesus Christ. You know, he heals everyone that comes to him, right? He, he, he uh, takes out those unclean spirits. But when, 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 when he's done the business, he says, look, I've got to move on and find some other places that need to hear the gospel. That's why we're here on the Sunshine Coast, by the way. This is our area. We need to preach the gospel. There are many towns in this area. There are many little cities in this area. Yes, we're focusing in Caloundra, but eventually we need to spread out. We need to start knocking doors in other areas. And we've already done some of that. But we see the same thing with Jesus Christ. He's interested in going from place to place and not just staying in the one area preaching the gospel. All right, let's pray.